On June 17, 1843, a posse of European settlers set out for the Wairo Valley, planning to arrest two Ngāti Toa chiefs who are resisting efforts to force them off the land. But this attempted arrest turns to disaster. A gun battle breaks out. 26 people are killed, including several European prisoners executed in the aftermath. Ko Justin Murray tēnei. Ko William Ray Aho. Today, many describe the events at Wairo as the first battle of the New Zealand Wars, a series of conflicts over land between European colonists and indigenous Māori tribes. So what happened and why? To find out, check out New Zealand Wars, Stories of Wairo, a deep dive into a tipping point in New Zealand history. You can follow and listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is an RNZ podcast. Hi, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep, a series that tells the stories of some shady, controversial and sometimes downright villainous characters from New Zealand history. I guess I should start by explaining why we've chosen this slightly weird name. Originally, it was going to be something like Villains, But the more I looked into the stories of the people I wanted to feature in this series, the more tricky that name became, because villainy is an eye of the beholder sort of thing. The people in this series did some horrible things, but sometimes they had good reasons for doing so, or at least they thought they did. Labelling them simply as villains didn't seem fair. So me and the head of the podcast unit at RNZ, Tim Watkin, went back and forth, coming up with different ideas for names, rejecting them, and then one day Tim was in a taxi making small talk with the driver trying to explain what the series was all about. And the driver comes back and says, oh right, they're like the black sheep of New Zealand history. So there you have it, black sheep. Hope you enjoy it. We're on Nelson Crescent, a street near the centre of town in Napier, a couple of blocks from the seaside. It's early in the evening, a young couple are walking together, they're arguing. The woman seems furious, the man's sullen, frustrated. Someone walks up to them, it's one of the man's friends. He tells the man to come with him, she yells at the friend and punches him in the head. He shoves her and she falls to the ground, then the friend walks away. The friend hears the shots and four shots and then another one. The friend turns around in time to see his mate, 21-year-old Bert West, fall to the ground, bullet holes in his head, face, neck and chest. The woman, Bert's girlfriend, Alice Parkinson, is still standing, in one hand still smoking and spattered with blood, is the gun. Someone in the street screams, Alice, what have you done? Then they see blood oozing from her temple. Bert is almost dead and is taken to hospital. He never recovers consciousness. Alice is half conscious. She's got this bullet in her in her head and she slumps and someone half lifts her, half carries her to a neighbour, a friend, and she goes to hospital too. That's Carol Markwell. She's a playwright and she came across this grim story of Bert and Alice a few years back when she was looking for an idea for a play. It might sound like the start of an episode of CSI. This attempt at a murder-suicide seems like a very modern crime. But this scene is more than 101 years old. It's March 2nd, 1915. The First World War has been going for less than a year. The Anzacs haven't even set sail for Gallipoli yet. It's a little story, but it's a big story. Mm. That's what drew me to it, I think. Um, that there was, uh, once I'd finally figured out what happened and, and when it happened and how it happened from all sorts of sources, there were these wider overtones, wider ramifications of social issues, of justice, you know, times have changed so much. To get going, Carol first had to go backwards to when Alice and Bert first met. It's nothing too exciting. She's a waitress at the big hotel in town. He's a lifter at the rail workshop. They met, well, no one really knows how they met, but it was probably at Alice's hotel while Bert was drinking with some mates. What we do know is the relationship lasted about two years and was serious enough that Alice got pregnant. Sex and pregnancy outside marriage wasn't as unusual in the early 1900s as we might assume today, but there was a very heavy expectation that when it did happen, the couple would marry. A girl who didn't marry and had a child out of wedlock had lost her character. She couldn't easily get a job. She'd lost her reputation. So Alice 
wanted to marry as quickly as possible. Like a lot of blokes who face unexpected fatherhood, Bert's less enthusiastic. His mother's furious with both him and Alice, but he goes along with it. He offers to pay her medical fees, tells her to set up a home for the two of them, and says he'll marry Alice after the baby's born. But when Alice goes into labour, it all goes wrong. A tragedy it was a, a hideous birth, um, without all the modern, um, you know, anaesthetics and things we have now. And the baby died, and Alice was just bereft. Um, it seems from reading the notes that she was almost beside herself. Um, you can imagine the relationship falls apart. Bert is still really. I mean, he did come and see her in the hospital. He's still saying, "Oh, we'll get married. We'll get married." But the days and the weeks drag on, and uh, Alice is still desperately trying to marry, and Bert is kind of dragging his feet more. I mean, it gets and almost ridiculous because she books, you know, books a time for them to go get married, and then he won't show up, and this happens yeah, several times. She makes an appointment with Canon Tuke from the church, St Augustine's, for them to come, and Bert says, yes, he'll come. And she turns up and he doesn't. And this happens, as you say, yeah, repeatedly. Alice is desperate. She writes a lot of letters to Bert's mother at this time. They make for unpleasant reading. Mrs West, seeing as you have done your utmost to part Bert and I, well, let me tell you, you're going to be sorry because he shall never marry anybody else. He turns around and asks me for my last penny, the rotten cur, and still says he's going to marry me. Do you think yourself that he has any principle, although he's your, your son? Your son, Bert, is nothing but a low, dirty crawler, and you are worse to interfere. But don't think you will have the last laugh over me. Bert hasn't been man enough to tell me that he doesn't want to marry me. He's supposed to tomorrow morning, and if he doesn't, he will He'll suffer. suffer as I have. God only knows that I went through enough for him. I won't let him live to ruin another girl. And after treating me like this, well, he's not fit to live. I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to shoot the both of us. No, 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 no! <laughs> Which takes us back to that night in Napier. Bert's dead. Alice is in hospital with a bullet in her brain. It stays there for the rest of her life. But... Almost miraculously, she recovers. This is where the story starts to get interesting, because again, in what seems like a very modern twist, Alice Parkinson starts making headlines all around the country. Sensational shooting of Burt West. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Alice Parkinson charged with willful murder. Her letters to the deceased's mother reserves her defence and is committed for trial. It seems like a slam dunk for the prosecution. They've got witnesses. The gun was in her hand. They have the letters she wrote too. The judge, Chief Justice Sir Robert Stout, had no sympathy for Alice. His summary of the case to the jury was blunt. And because the deceased refused to marry her, that was no reason why she should have shot him. She could have sued him in the courts. There was no provocation for the act. There was no provocation at all. Stout's a strange character. He was an influential champion of equal rights for women, but he's also a prominent eugenicist. By that we mean he believed that things like crime and poverty had genetic causes, which could and should be bred out of society by removing undesirable people from the gene pool. These days we think of eugenics as being something the Nazis invented, but it was actually popular all around the world in the early 1900s. It was only after Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust that people decided it wasn't such a great idea. I mean, he wasn't alone. There were prison wardens and quite eminent people in New Zealand. There was a movement, a eugenics mu movement in New Zealand at that time. Yes, he thought we needed to reduce the criminal classes. And this is the thing. He, he considered her not as someone who was an otherwise good person who'd done something bad, he saw her as part of a class of human being who was predisposed to do bad things and must be sealed away from the rest of humanity. I'm sure that's how he saw her, and he mentions her language. She says, you rotten cur, and other things like that. I'll see that you don't, you know. He's, so he, he seems to feel she's not a nice woman. 
Luckily for Alice, she has a spectacular lawyer, an Irish guy called Barney Dolan. Look at the transcripts of the trial and you'll see a defence so dramatic it wouldn't sound out of place on Suits or Boston Legal. A country girl, corrupted by the malign influences in town. The mother of an illegitimate child, spurned by her paramour, rebuffed by his relations. A country girl pouring out her love and her hate in the agonies of her pregnancy and the tortures of her labour. Provocation? Was there ever as much? Dolan even went so far as to say Alice was acting in self-defence, that Bert tried to grab the gun and Alice was forced to shoot him. The members of the all-male jury weren't prepared to accept that, but in the end, they went easy on Alice. They refused to convict her for murder, and even though she was found guilty of manslaughter, they gave a strongly worded message to the judge that she should be treated with mercy. There are two views of women criminals at this time. One is that they're worse than men. They're evil, they're wicked. But there's another view that says they're broken blossoms, they're poor, frail women. And and Alice's case particularly seduced, betrayed. I mean, it's an absolute classic, you know, the poor fallen woman betrayed by her man. And her jury obviously had a lot of feeling for her. Justice Stout was having none of it. He dismisses the jury's suggestion of mercy out of hand and sentences Alice to life in prison. And in those days, life meant life. There was no probation, no parole, and no real prospect of an appeal. The judge's word was final. But when Alice is locked away... Something strange happens. Her story does the 1915 version of going viral. There wasn't Facebook, Reddit or Twitter, but there was a newspaper, this country's first national tabloid, the New Zealand Truth, which had been founded 10 years ago by an alcoholic megalomaniac called John Norton, an Australian, by the way. And Truth took her case up with a vengeance, really, and they crusaded for her, and Truth went into a lot of homes in New Zealand, but also... Something in her case struck New Zealand imagination. It it struck a chord. And Truth wasn't the only one. Um, local papers got onto it. A lot of these articles were really critical of Justice Stout. His eugenic view of crime might have been popular among the ruling classes, but not so much the ordinary people. In its articles on Alice, the Truth wrote that something had happened that soured the milk of human kindness in Stout. They suggested old age as impairing his sense of proportion when it came to the callous sentence he imposed on poor Alice Parkinson. At the same time as The Truth and other newspapers raised the profile of Alice's case, other groups rallied to her side, particularly women's rights groups and trade unions. One prominent unionist who wrote a lot about Alice was Harry Holland, another Australian who eventually becomes the second leader of the New Zealand Labour Party. In the hour of her overwhelming despair... She hurled her betrayer to a swift grave. It's certainly a dreadful deed, an act not to be encouraged. But was she responsible? Society provided no adequate punishment for the man. Society flung the woman among hissing serpents and slow-burning fires. Surely... Whatever crime there was belongs not to the girl, but to society. Dramatic stuff. A lot of people agreed, though. The truth got so many letters of support for Alice it couldn't publish them all. People sent fruit and lollies to her in prison. One guy even offered to marry her. In the six years she spent in prison, there were three separate petitions asking the government to change the law so Alice could be freed. One of them signed by 100,000 people. 100,000. This at a time when New Zealand's population was less than 1.2 million. And in the end, they win. In 1920, the government passes the Crimes Amendment Bill, allowing prisoners like Alice to appeal their sentences to be released on probation. There's some more wrangling, but the next year, Alice is released from prison. The question you've got to ask is, why? Why was there so much sympathy for this woman? And what about the victim, 21-year-old Bert West? Did he deserve to die for failing to follow through on a promise? All I could think when I first heard this story was how much less sympathy I think Alice would get if she committed this crime today, even though we live in a much more feminist society. I asked Carol Markwell what she thought. I think that's true. Um, But at that time, it just seemed to focus 
a lot of different unhappinesses. Um, women were flexing their muscles a bit. They got the idea that you could achieve something. You could achieve the vote, something as big as that, if you met and if you kept on keeping on and you weren't dissuaded, you just kept meeting and asking. You know, justice isn't just an implacable wall. You can, you can eat away at it. Also, consider the backdrop to this case. The First World War is grinding up human beings on a scale never seen before. Ordinary New Zealanders couldn't do anything about the epic injustice of that war, but they could do something about Alice. For Carol, there's one other thing that explains people's reaction to Alice's case. We told you earlier that before carrying out the murder, Alice went into labour and her baby died. We mentioned it was horrific, but to understand that horror fully, you need to hear the detail of what happened to her. I should warn you, this next part's quite graphic, so if you've got kids listening or you'll think you'll find this distressing, then maybe hit the fast-forward button and jump a minute ahead. Alice went into labour and she's in a nursing home, but the baby is transverse, it's lying across her. It could not, at that stage, be born. And um, the baby, in the end, had to be dismembered for one of them to survive, for Alice to survive. And she, I mean, she would have been conscious through this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, she took a long time to recover. And when she, she discharged herself, she was so anxious to get married quickly. And the doctors were saying, you should rest, you should recuperate. But she didn't. And she was really, I think, still in the state mm-hmm. when she killed Bert. And I think the women who flocked in and, and supported her I mean, they knew about harrowing childbirth. Um, And this is, I think, another reason she had a lot of support. You might be thinking it sounds a lot like Alice was suffering from post-traumatic stress or postnatal depression. You could be right. But it's difficult to diagnose a historical figure with mental illness. Let's also not forget that lots of women suffer traumatic births, both now and in the past, and they generally don't go on to commit a premeditated killing. Then again, the question wasn't whether Alice should have got off scot-free for killing Bert, it was whether she deserved to spend her entire life in jail for it. Whatever the reason, Alice gets released. And for a long time, that's it. Nobody knew how her story ended. Carol wrote a play about Alice's story. It's called With Hard Labour. She also wrote a book about her, Alice, What Have You Done? The Case of Alice May Parkinson. Just before her play was about to go on stage in 1995, Carol got a phone call. And a man said, are you anything to do with this Alice Parkinson? And I said, yes. (laughs) Are you one of the family? And he said, yes, I ought to be. I'm a son. And I just... (laughs) My heart just turned over. I said, oh... (laughs) And he said he would like to see the play. He hadn't known much. He knew something bad had happened in the family, but he didn't really know. It was all kind of shrouded in mystery. And so he sat and watched the story of his mother told on stage. Thanks to Alice's son, Carol Markwell was able to write the final chapter of Alice Parkinson's story, that after prison, she found love. She married, had six children, children who grew up seeing their mother suffer headaches her whole life, a reminder of the bullets still lodged in her brain. But they never knew the first part of her story, the story of a killer who rallied so much public sympathy, the government was forced to change the law to get her out of prison. Special thanks to Carol Markwell. If you want more detail about Alice Parkinson, you should check out her book, Alice, What Have You Done? The Story of Alice Parkinson. And if you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to rate us on iTunes. And while you're there, check out RNZ's other great podcasts. You can also find them on our website, rnz.co.nz. Next week, historian Mark Darby explains how the son of an Irish turnip farmer rose to the very top of the New Zealand police and how he didn't pay too much attention to whose neck he stepped on along the way. You can look at this now and think, what an absolutely appalling way to behave, and it was. But it was largely driven by the fact that he was so convinced that he was right, and he had the confidence of the government that he could get away with things that were, on the face of it, flagrantly illegal. 
Black Sheep was written and presented by me, William Ray, edited by Jason McClellan. The executive producers, Tim Watkin. Extra help this week in the voice acting department from Megan Whelan, Adam McCauley and Duncan Smith. Music was by Kimbra, who's actually an old mate of mine from Hillcrest High School in Hamilton.